Does naughty step not work? No, it's terrible. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> Meet Dr. Patricia Brito, an accomplished educational psychologist dedicated to improving vulnerable children's lives. She is here to talk about how to develop emotional intelligence and how to raise future leaders. Working with a whole bunch of vulnerable people just solidified, I have to pursue this, I have to keep going. I'm blessed, so I want to be a blessing. Even as a psychologist, I was highly anxious. Motherhood is hard work. Thinking about effective leaders, we have to go back to the basics. You really do. All children should be specifically put into a program where they learn social skills and conflict resolution skills. How do we resolve this conflict amicably and walk away peacefully? We also need to address children's needs. What's stopping them from learning these skills to potentially become an effective leader in the future? What's the best piece of parenting advice you've received? Before we dive in, I have some very exciting news. We've teamed up with Corporate Ladder Decoded. If you love our content, support the show by checking out their Accelerate course that covers 10 game-changing strategies to help you accelerate your corporate career and get paid your worth. Or check out their Kickstarter with Ignite. Full transparency, using it supports us at no extra cost to you. Ready to crack the code to your corporate success and earn what you deserve? Click on our affiliate link in the show notes. Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. If you're a regular here, there's a very easy way to show your support and to help us grow. Download the Fountain app on your mobile, follow Anatomy of a Leader with Maria Vorostovsky, and just start listening. You can share your thoughts on this episode by sending a boost. It's like a payment with a message. And see what other listeners have to say or create clips that you could share with others. Getting started is super easy and you can top up your Fountain wallet with your bank card. Oh, and you can also earn rewards by listening to the Fountain app too. It's seriously a no brainer. Follow the link in the show notes or visit fountain.fm to find out more. Patricia, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you. Good to have you on the show. I am absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you. Very, very interested to talk to you. Yes. But let's just dive straight in. Okay. What do you love most about your field, educational psychology? Being able to see children thrive and not just survive. That's the part that I love the most. Being able to identify a child's needs, make it uh, very clear to the people supporting children and young people that I work with and giving them the tools that they could use to support them to make progress. That's what I love when I see, um, when I do review meetings, for example, and I see that some of the strategies that we have co-constructed with families and schools are actually making a positive difference and actually helping the school to be able to support the child to access learning and is helping the family as well to be able to integrate and interact. And, um, you know, everyone is moving forward. And that's what makes me happy. That's what I find very rewarding. Mm. How did you get into it? <sighs> Where do I start? So actually, so my dad is a medical doctor and I was obviously influenced by that and I wanted to be a doctor. Then I realised I, I don't like blood. <laughs> no, neither do I, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I actually do not like the sight of blood. So I thought, well, I, c- I can't be a medical doctor if I don't like blood. You know, that's not going to work. Um, So when I was in year 10 at secondary school, um, we used to do this sort of questionnaire to help you to organise your sort of thinking, your personality and come up with the kind of job role that might be suitable for you. And um, I I completed that questionnaire and a a list of jobs came about in terms of psychotherapy, psychology, counselling all that type of stuff. And um, the careers lady at my school actually said, oh, I've got an auntie who is the um, manager at uh, an old government in, uh, initiative called Sure Start. Um, she said, would you like to do work experience with her? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? So I spent two weeks um, at the um, Gypsy Hill Sure Start. The lady's called Kim. I can't find it anywhere. So wherever you are, if you're watching this, hello. <laughs> Let's find this lady. I know. <laughs> Let's find her because she changed my life. Um, so here I was, this 15-year-old, uh, spending two weeks with Gypsy Hill Shaw Start, and she allowed me to shadow each professional. So one day I was with her social worker, one day with a nutrition nutritionist, one day I would do home visits to watch uh Uh, someone do a baby massage class for example and I also spent time with psychologists and I thought well this is the 
part that I loved the most. I would love to be a psychologist. And going back to the questionnaire, it matched the type of career that would be most suitable to me. And I've pursued it ever since. So every single job that I'd done from the age of 16 was with children and young people, vulnerable children and young people in particular. My first job was actually at a play scheme where we would uh, pick the children up from their homes and take them out for activities during the day. It was a respite care service for parents who had children with uh, disabilities and for them to have time to themselves. Mm. So uh, I, I'd done that for about five years for every Easter and every summer holiday. Even when I went to university, I carried on with it. And I think my only ever job outside of working with vulnerable children and young people or just vulnerable people was... I think I had a job once, a Christmas temp job doing retail while I was at University of Portsmouth. And that's about it. Um, everything else have channeled my whole life, my whole career to become where I am today. Mm. Because t- what attracted you or what did you find interesting to work with vulnerable children? Why? 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, okay, so when I was in that room at the age of 15, filled with lots of children with different kinds of disabilities. So we're talking children that were blind, children that were, um, that had a a hearing impairment um, and children that had um, neurodiverse needs. It was quite overwhelming for a 15 year old to be in that room because I was suddenly exposed to a world that I knew nothing about. And I went home to cry that day and I just wanted to help. And I thought, what can I do to help? And the more I was exposed to it, the more opportunities I had to work in that sector, I just felt like I, would, I want to make a difference. This is the imprint I want to live in the world. This is my legacy to help children, vulnerable children, wherever they are in the world, not just in England. I would love to help children globally. Mm. I remember when I was younger and I thought you know it'd be so you know I studied psychology I thought you know psychiatry was really interesting and I did think about having to listen to difficult and challenging stories and having to almost take on that burden that emotional burden from the other person and and listen to it and deal with it Mm. and I remember and I pointedly decided then that I I could not do that like what you said about not being able to deal with blood Mm. having to deal with just so much emotional trauma felt overwhelming to me yeah have you experienced that yourself yes so as a young child um I had my own challenges I think lots of people have had challenges and in fact I actually had a psychologist myself as a child, an educational psychologist who helps me to gain lots of confidence. I was being bullied at school, um, that affected my social, emotional, mental well-being. And um, again, her name is Mel, wherever you are. Hello. <laughs> Let's find the ball. Yeah, exactly, you changed my life. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and you know, uh, she. we've done lots of um, self-esteem, confidence building type of work, and it really did change my life. It changed my outlook how I saw myself, how I interacted with people. So I think it stemmed from there as well. I think the seed was planted, obviously, by my dad um, in terms of him seeing him become a doctor and I wanted to to, uh, do the same and then um, realising I didn't like blood, but then I needed to support myself and I was supported and then I wanted to support others, so to give back. So the experience of having somebody who was helping you through you know, difficult challenges, you're talking about being bullied. Yeah. That made an impact on you. They're thinking, well, I can do that too. Yes. Yeah. But I don't think I realised at that point mm. that that's what I wanted to do. I was still pursuing this whole medical uh, doctor career at mm. that point. Um, I think it was, yes, it was the point where I completed that questionnaire, which looked at my personality and the type of person I am. That made me think, yes, actually, I would love to do that. And also, I used to watch Dr. Phil. Did you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, as a young um, teenager, and I thought, oh, well, his job looks quite interesting. I would love to do that. Mm. And um, then it just, the desire just grew stronger and stronger from having teaching experience as well and having, you know, lots of young people wanting to talk to me about their concerns, about their issues, sharing their diagnosis with me that they had at the time um, and letting me know about their you know, difficulties within the family. I found myself while I was teaching doing more of that 
than the teaching actually because the children and young people that I was um, working with were vulnerable and you know from young people who were 16 and didn't know how to read and um, they had dyslexia but it wasn't identified for example um, you know young people who were asylum seekers and yeah so you know working with a whole bunch of vulnerable people whether they had a special educational need or not just solidified I have to pursue this I have to keep going Mm -hmm. and obviously I'd done a degree in psychology uh, then I went to do my master's in mental health in learning disabilities so I have just been around vulnerable people quite a lot and where I'm blessed so I want to be a blessing and with my knowledge and expertise Mm -hmm. you know why not put that to good use do you get overwhelmed sometimes yes Mm. how do you cope with that yourself well there's a rule every psychologist has to have supervision by another psychologist which is something that you do once a month and you meet with them and talk about your work talk about your well-being your uh, personal issues if you like and it's time for you to reflect to um, think and to receive advice and support and to grow as well so that's really important to me and when I was a trainee it was once every week that was really important so that's what helps to keep me going so I often write a list of things I want to talk about in supervision and sometimes some of those concerns become solved before supervision and then at supervision I share them so that's very important and outside of that I think it's important to find you know loved ones people that you trust that you can Uh, talk about your life with as well because I carry the problems of the world on my shoulders you know Mm. and problem solve people's concerns all the time and once people hear your psychologist they tell you all the problems (laughs) let me (laughs) help me fix myself like what's wrong with me I guess you know whenever you meet like a dentist or something it's like oh by the way can you look you know take a you know look inside my mouth or you know fix me up so yes Yes. what's, what's the most common thing that you hear actually from people um, it really depends on what's in the media. So, for example, um, ADHD is a hot topic at the moment. Mm-hmm. So everyone's concerned about whether their child has ADHD. So that seems to be a common theme that I hear quite a lot. Mm. So they want to talk about their children, the issues yes. with their kids, right? Yes, or their childhood trauma. Okay. Yeah. Wow, even that straight yeah. away? Straight away, yes. Interesting. Yes. I could meet someone at the train station and, mm-hmm. you know, they could just say, I like your bag. What do you do? Oh, I'm a psychologist. And then d- there you go. <laughs> floodgates open and what do you do in that situation because I mean that's quite hard having to handle everybody else and it's like well wait, wait a second I'm you know waiting for my train here or waiting yeah. for my cup of coffee I'm having like a little break like yeah. how do you cope with I that? mean obviously I've learned from that so I don't really tell people I'm a psychologist right okay let's just try to keep this to myself <laughs> yeah right. I mean, if I'm in a networking situation, yes, I would highlight that. And um, it depending on the context, um, yes, I, I, I try not to share it too much. But sometimes I actually want to help because sometimes I think it's, I don't know if every psychologist feels this way, but you just feel responsible for um, the individuals that have opened up to you. And you think, oh, okay, if I don't address this, what is this person going to do next? So you end up, supporting them giving them something that they can walk away with and signposting them for where they can get additional support Mm. that is actually formal um you know whether it's for a charity service or the national health service for example Mm -hmm. yeah in your line of work what's the most common challenges that you're dealing with that the children whether it's adhd being neurodiverse or childhood traumas like what's the most common thing that you face every day um, at the moment, a lot of parents are concerned whether the child has um, autism spectrum condition or ADHD. That's the main one. Or Why dyslexia. is that? Is it because it's more now talked about in the social media? Is that because people are just more faced with that? Um, yes, I think it's a lot. It's really highlighted a lot, actually, in the media at the moment. Um, lots of celebrities going to get um, assessments done and, you know, finding out that they have the diagnosis of some sort of um, neurodiverse need. And that has made people think, oh, maybe I have that too. And obviously, uh, professionals have got more advanced tools and techniques to identify those concerns. So um, it's become a hot topic However, that's not the only need that children have. And that's where I come in to educate people. So, for example, there's an overlap between attachment difficulties 
and um, symptoms of autism. And there's an overlap between trauma and symptoms of ADHD. Let me just back up a little bit. So attachment, what did you say? What's the word? Attachment difficulties. Attachment difficulties. Tell me what that is. Okay, so attachment is the opportunity for a child to create a bond with a primary caregiver Mm -hmm. from when they're born. And not all children develop a secure attachment style because that would involve a parent or primary caregiver, whether it's a guardian or a carer, um, meeting the child's needs and helping the child to feel secure. Um, And children who develop that go on, according to, you know, the attachment theory, go on to have uh, thriving lives and succeed. And um, they have... um, less concerns in terms of social interaction, in terms of forming, you know, positive relationships and so forth. Um, but not all children develop secure attachment styles. So, and is that to do with the child or is it to do with the parent? It's to do with the situation, I would say, because I don't want parents to take blame, to be honest. Um, it's to do with circumstances. So I, I work with a lot of children who have gone into care because they were born in circumstances. Maybe their parents were alcohol and drug addicts and couldn't care for them. And all their parents had experienced poverty, for example. You know, let's talk about that, you know, the social economic crisis and how that's impacting people, um, which means the parents are not emotionally available to provide that love, care, and support to their children and meet their needs. Um, Cultural and religious practices sometimes influence the development of attachment difficulties. So for example, when I had a child in my culture, a lot of people believe in the cry out system, which I absolutely hate. (laughs) So I was advised, oh, just let your daughter cry out, let her cry out and then, you know, she'll be sleep trained and you'll be all right. And I said, no, I believe in the attachment theory. If my daughter wants to sleep on my chest, for the whole night that's what would happen and that's what I'd done you know mm. um this advice of you know when the child is six months put them in their own room no my my child slipped in our bed up until she was one and then you know and even now she's free and she wants to come into our room halfway through the night and that's okay it's about having that closeness that love that bond helping her to feel secure and confident helping her to know that we are not going anywhere and what that has is I mean all children go for separation anxiety at some point in their life at the early stages but now she's so secure so she can go to preschool and say bye mommy she knows I'm coming back Mm. and she trusts that I'm coming back and it's having a ripple effect on her in her confidence her confidence in building um, relationships with her peers and you know engaging in parallel play because that's what's age appropriate developmentally for her stage at the moment and developing relationships with adults as well so it has a positive ripple effect so you have those who develop an anxious attachment style avoidant attachment style uh, because of the circumstances they were exposed to during their early years whether it's trauma neglect and, and so forth And those symptoms mirror symptoms of autism. That's very interesting. Going back to the cry out method, I'm Mm. curious, what does the data say about that? You think that that's not the right approach. Yeah. And having that closeness and being emotionally there as well as physically there for your child is the approach that you have yourself taken. Yes. What is the data about the cried out method? not quite sure if research has specifically looked at that but if you look at research linked to the attachment theory it's about having closeness and being emotionally available for your Mm. child and being present and offer meeting your child's needs uh you know picture it this way children come into the world the only voices they hear when they're in a womb is probably the mother's voice that they recognize the most and the father's voice or um you know, whoever's around um, a pregnant woman um, or or a pregnant person. And um, when they are born, they are almost like new to, well, they are new, they're new to a brand new world and they need to be nurtured, they need to be cared for, they need to develop trust, they need to, you know, develop that sense of security and to not develop a sense of abandonment or experience neglect or trauma. Every individual wants to be loved and be loved. So that's why I think that's important and that's my method. Um, I mean, I'm not against people who want to take that approach. 
I never tell people don't do this or do that. That's not my place. I'll just share what research shows mm. and it's entirely up to you which method you choose to take. Mm. Um, but for me, I mean, I've seen it work in my household um, in terms of, I cared about attachment from the moment she was born, mm. you know, um, not just for myself, but for my husband as well. You know, it was, it was really important for us to have that skin to skin contact with um for my child and my husband mm -hmm. to have that um, continuously actually, for them to develop that bond um, and for her to feel that extreme sense of love and confidence that we are coming back. Mm. So we never really experienced separa separation anxiety for that long. Mm. Well, I have two kids. Yeah, I've done some AV testing okay. on this. Okay. <laughs> the first child did attempt the cried out method. Yeah, uh, Not probably not to the same extent as probably what the books will tell you to do mm. but to some degree there have been days where she would cry out to go to sleep it was the most excruciatingly awful thing that I have gone through mm. and I never did that with my second son with, with my son who was the second born and I still think that my daughter is probably more anxious and I really boil it down to the kind of crying out and my son I find he's a lot easier to deal with emotions he gets more comforted much easier so the difference between them is quite marked I know kids are different mm. but I really do think that those two styles mm. have like impacted so I would, that's interesting if I were to have a, a, a yeah. child again I would not do the cry out method just wouldn't I'm glad we agree on that yeah <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I mean it's traumatizing for the parent I can only imagine what it's like for the child. Exactly. Where you're just like completely abandoned. Yeah, and you're brand new to the world mm -hmm. and you're still developing skills. Your brain is still developing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yesterday on my social media, I posted something about the prefrontal cortex and how actually it doesn't develop up until you're almost 30. And the reason why the age range I work with is up to 25 is because research shows you don't become an adult until that age so actually a lot of your uh, responses will be impulsive because the emotional part of your brain the amygdala is what's driving that and um, think about a baby who is still developing their brain still trying to become accustomed to where they are you know it's if babies could talk about that experience from you know, being in a womb to being born, that it's in itself is traumatizing, I think, to be honest. So I think it's really important to give them that love, that support, that cuddling as much as possible. And um, that's why I don't agree with it. It just, mm. it just doesn't sit well with me. Mm. You talk about that the, the, the attachment difficulties can be very similar to, you know, being on the spectrum, talking yes. about autism. Yes, some um, Yes. Talk me through how as a parent you can support a child with autism or ADHD? Okay, so when it comes to autism, let's tackle that first, it's a big spectrum. So um, you and I may have traits, for example, but that doesn't necessarily mean we are on, um, we fit the profile to have a diagnosis according to the um, DSM-5, for example, or um, the assessment tools. Um, so when you do have a child with a diagnosis of autism spectrum condition, it's important to get to know your child and get to know how they present, what are their differences and what's unique to them. Because that's the baseline of the strategies that any professional may suggest and how to actually support them. So for example, if your child is nonverbal, which I have to say, being nonverbal doesn't mean your child has autism. Your child may just have a speech language difficulty. Uh, but children who are nonverbal and have the diagnosis of autism, if that's the case, strategies such as using visual aids, using um, nonverbal communications cues like uh, picture exchange communication, we call it PECS. It's a method where a child can use a visual to exchange for something else that they want. You can use things like objects of reference to communicate with them. So for example, a cup could represent that they want a drink. So you could train them to use that to communicate because whether they have this diagnosis or not, you want them to be able to function adequately to their potential, to maximize their potential. And um, so it's important to get to know your child and whether you're a parent or a school staff, you need to get to know the children that you're working with and the children that you, you live with, you know, whether your aunt, uncle, um, 
regardless of who you are. So I think that's the first step. And then if you were to read parenting books or you were to get strategies from someone like me, you can then apply that and you can pitch it at the appropriate level. For example, um, some children who are verbal and can engage in social skills program would need that. So I would, I would, you know, recommend social skills program. For example, something called Circle of Friends. Uh, these are evidence based research shows that they work or they they make a positive difference. Um, that's you know, those are the kind of things that I would suggest. And what's really important, I think, no one really talks about is emotional regulation strategies mm. not just for the children but for the parents i am so with you on that <laughs> and this is something that i didn't anticipate having to face before i became a parent how i mean kids push your buttons kids you know you're stressed you haven't slept if you're a working parent you have all the extra pressures on top of you time is extremely limited you want to be there for your kids but there are moments when you know you're you're missing your deadline your boss is annoyed with you you're having a fight with your partner and your kids just will not have the banana the way they want it <laughs> yeah. and it's just like it's the end of the world yes. and you lose your cool it's mm. you know it's hard to 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 maintain that rationality and be like that perfect mother mm. that you know the nurturing the loving yeah. wearing all white you know, no, yeah. there's flowing. no such thing by the way <laughs> well this is it and i've recently read a book which is called raising a happier mother mm. with you know it's like raising a happy child with it crossed out yes and that really got me to think about it in a very very different way how mm. Before we even look at supporting the kids, yes. we first need to look about how we need to support ourselves Absolutely. as parents. And that is something that we actually don't talk about at all. No. Or I have, this has not been a conversation that I've had mm. about how do you support yourself yes. during those challenges and how much emotional work you have to do and how much work you have to do in your own emotional intelligence yes. to be able to deal with that and I think for women in particular who are the ones who are having to deal with that most of the time because you're probably the primary caregiver yes. to your kids yes so you're having to navigate that yep. any tips for mothers or parents having to deal with their own emotions when whilst parenting well like you know the flight um workers would say to you the flight attendants put the oxygen mask on yourself first if your cup isn't filled there's no way you can support anyone whether it's your children your partner you can't you can't be there for anyone so it's really important that you look after yourself and create that time for yourself and that's something that I've really uh, taken on board recently personally for myself so I wouldn't I don't like to give advice that I haven't tried mm. <laughs> so um, I have really taken you know that that on in terms of making sure I look after myself making sure that I have time for friends family and not just be a mother uh, because it can be draining motherhood is hard work I know people like to glamorize motherhood but I don't think Yes, it can be glamorous, but that's not all that there is well, to Instagram, it. Well, Instagram, I don't know where it's glamorous. <laughs> I don't feel glamorous when I'm parenting. So I don't even like, this is like this makeup. And this, this is like a complete facade. This is not what I look like in my day-to-day -day life. <laughs> but um, but what was really interesting what you were saying about how as a child psychologist, you know, somebody who works with, with, with children, how you yourself get a psychologist to yeah. almost... I mean, yes, you can, it can be a mentor, but it's also somebody who is, you know, dedicated to your own Absolutely. mental health. Yes. And, okay, maybe we, you know, we have our parents, mm -hmm. but we don't have somebody dedicated to mothers, mothers for no. that support. No. I mean, I speak from it probably slightly biased as well, because I, I've lost my own mother, so I don't so have to somebody that. to, thank you, mm -hmm. um, I don't have somebody who still mothers me, mm -hmm. and that is d deeply, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. But not all parents, especially the older generations, are or have been that well equipped to be parents. Like nobody gives you a guidebook. No, not like at all. you know, a child is born, you're like, yeah. off you go. Yeah. No education. Yes. No degree. No like no preparation. And that's at terrible. All. Yes. That's terrible to me. And that's what prompted me to start doing parental workshops. Not just for mothers, for fathers as well, in terms of 
come in to learn what to do to support your children, young people. And, you know, I tailor it according to the theme that is most prominent or people are requesting for. I think that's really important because we spend a lot of time going to antenatal classes, but what about after the baby is born? So true. And even as a psychologist, I, myself, Dr. Patricia, was highly anxious when I had my baby because I was worried about getting it wrong because mm. I know what could potentially come out of that. So I had my supervisor say to me, Patricia, be careful. You don't want your daughter to develop an anxious attachment style. So you need to be relaxed, take some time, look after yourself so you don't have to, you know, be a perfectionist about motherhood because there's no such thing. So I think saying that is really important to mothers, having forums for mothers to gather, to learn, support one another, to network, and to be able to say, this is hard. Mm -hmm. I think even saying that in some cultures is a taboo because I had people say to me, you're supposed to be grateful that you've got a child because some people have difficulties in that area. But just because I'm blessed to have a child doesn't mean I wouldn't face difficulties mm. and it doesn't mean that I shouldn't open up to that if I'm facing difficulties I am and if I need support I do and why is that not okay mm. so that's that's my concern about society too any groups that you can recommend post having children having that circle of other people who will care about your own mental health your well-being I guess you know parenting support groups yeah I'll tell you what app helped me because I had a child during COVID so I couldn't access any parent to support group was the peanut app so you could be wide awake at 3am in the morning because your baby wouldn't sleep and you will find another mother who is wide awake at 3am in the morning on the peanut app and you'll both be talking about how annoying it is <laughs> we're having to stay up and yeah. not being able to sleep yeah it's true it's like when people say oh how well, you know what can I help with and it's like we'll be there at like you know 3 a.m in yeah, the morning exactly. like, yeah. feeding or you know helping me with you know back massage you know that's the times that you need somebody the yeah. most yes so that, yeah that's that, a really good idea it really yeah. helped me actually because you find mothers who have children of the same age as well that are even roughly the same mum so you're basically going through the same thing at the same time in your local area so that was quite lovely mm. um you know to be able to talk about that and talk about things like oh yeah my husband's sleeping and I'm not <laughs> you talked about you wouldn't recommend anything that you wouldn't do yourself yes what has worked for you to take the overwhelm away like what practically that you put into your life in place that has helped you I had to be honest with myself. So initially when I went back to work, I was doing five days and four, for example, and it was ridiculous trying to meet those demands. I was doing it because I'm someone who pushes myself, but then you know, that had a negative ripple effect on my well-being and how I present as a mother. You know, being a stressed out mother is not a good thing in my, in my view. So I think being a relaxed mother is much better. So I started my business. Um, in terms of uh, providing um, workshops and also working as an associate for different local authorities. So I had contracts with different local authorities, uh, providing them um, support, picking up the work that their staff couldn't because they were um, overwhelmed, for example. And that's what started the business initially. And um, through that, it's grown into, grown bigger than I thought. And then it allowed me flexibility to be able to step down as well in terms of my um, full-time work to two days. And this is news actually, but recently I've even resigned from that. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, you know, um, because I have to think about my family as a whole mm -hmm. in terms of splitting myself into m too many multiple places. It's not a good idea. So how do I feel fulfilled because I like to work and it's not just for money but it's for my well-being um, I actually find motherhood harder than going to work tell me about it <laughs> <laughs> my husband and I remember especially in COVID we were saying how much harder it is to do like a day with kids yeah as opposed to day in work yeah you control your life. There isn't somebody who is demanding your attention, especially when you feel like you need a break or, you know, you're having to be constantly 
vigilant exactly. especially when they're at that toddler stage which yeah. I find so difficult Ugh. where you just like on constant like red alert yes and at work you control your time mm. okay maybe you have terrible colleagues maybe you have a toxic <laughs> boss yeah but the level of intensity that was on you is is different I mean of maybe course. if you I don't know I don't even know what to compare it to I think there were some studies saying how a day with very young children in particular was more stressful than working and where was that like my the mines or an oil rig yeah. or yeah. you know somewhere where you literally your physical life is in danger or even anyway it was yes. it was it was to that level yeah. and it's okay to say that for some people they will find it difficult to mm-hmm. actually be honest about that mm-hmm. but i think it's okay to say that actually that's you know that's why I don't even when people say I'm a stay at home mom say no you're working you're mm-hmm. also working at home because you are raising children which actually is much to me much more difficult than physically going out to work and um, it's as little things as having a lunch break on your own being able to eat your meal on your own is precious mm-hmm. <laughs> being able to go to the toilet on your own is precious and I have... don't know what that is <laughs> No, yeah, my kids are in school, so yeah, fine. Yeah, you know, um, just time to yourself. I think that was the aspect of motherhood. No one explained to me that you'll be making those sacrifices. So, for example, if the first thing you do in the morning is get up to use the toilet and grab a coffee, and then you can't do that because you have a baby next to you who is still sleeping, and the minute you get up, they'll, you know, they're awake, that changes the whole trajectory of how you have your morning routine and your life, for example. And all of the aspects, you know, wasn't highlighted. I've had to go through it. I've had to learn that on the job. Parenting is a job, Mm -hmm. in my view. Um, Which you learn on the job. Exactly. As opposed to having some sort of a guide or some sort of a training. Yes. I find really interesting. And I feel like uh, talking about women's skills and abilities, Mm. being able to just like pick that up without having had any previous, you know, an ed- even a book, okay, fine, we can read a book. Yeah. We can, you know, pay attention to what everybody's doing, but you literally are picking it up. Mm. There isn't a degree in no. parenting no. that majority people don't take. Yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely. So it's challenging. So my tip would be to find something that you love and enjoy, whether it's related to work or just a hobby that you focus on find a network of like-minded women or like-minded men that you can um, engage with and you can confidently share your difficulties and areas of strengths and not feel shame to be able to share that. I think that's really important and it's important to have something on a practical level like a calendar. We have a calendar uh, in our kitchen with mum's day out, dad's day out, that's very clear and it's protected and we get very precious if anything you know, inter, you know intervenes or interferes with that and I think that helps that helps to make sure that you are taking time to look mm. after yourself because otherwise it can be quite draining and and again if you're not emotionally regulated you you can't regulate another child it's virtually impossible mm. you actually need to be calm and that's something that wasn't taught you know you talked about how you know intergenerational parenting styles I don't think emotional regulation was ever really the focus point and I think it's very important because it's important for even when you go into the workforce you know how do you work with a colleague that you may not necessarily like for example how do you you know maintain well it gets on your nerves exactly like you wouldn't believe yeah yeah you know how do you build conflict resolution skills you know when you see conflict arising and you know how to diffuse it rather than letting it escalate for example i think if that was focused on we might have less young people in the criminal justice system for example you know and we might have you know less young people making um you know the, the wrong decisions about their life that has a long-term impact so i think um it all stems off by first of all recognizing the difficulties identifying it being able to say it finding ways to cater to yourself if you need therapeutic support seek that Mm -hmm. if you need um, support from actual formal therapists for example go for that I mean someone said to me oh are you saying that parents need a license before they become a parent it's like getting a driving license Mm -hmm. no I'm not saying that I'm just saying be equipped for should it go wrong and know how to seek support for yourself 
because you're still a person at the end of the day and not just a mother and not just a father. This is the realization that I have come to maybe even slightly before having kids, but more so now having had them about how emotional regulation of a mother is one of the most key things for society in general. Absolutely. And I think what we forget is like, okay, yes, kids need support, but I think mothers need support. Mm. And that comes from, you know, you're talking about, you know, have the calendar, Mm -hmm. have your date planned out, have a hobby. Mm. But in order for the mother to be able to take that day, there needs to be somebody who she trusts to leave the children with yes whether it's your partner whether it's your the grandparents whether it's a nanny for which you Tough. have to have money Tough. for yeah yeah um a neighbor you know a, a you know a friend you know family members mm. and what i didn't realize is just how big of a circle you need around you yeah to be an adequate parent and mm. adequate human being mm. and i think this is something that's been massively neglected and when you're talking about how you know, when people end up in the, you know, criminal system. Yeah. The mother wasn't supported and she wasn't able to provide that emotional regulation for her kids, mm. which then it's 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 then passed on. And Absolutely. until we curb that, and I that's for me personally, I think yeah. if we were to target that as a society to make that part yeah. much better, then it's almost like raising kids will just take care of itself. Exactly. There's so many layers to this. Mm-hmm. So you've got, for example, single mothers or single fathers who are doing it all on their own, may not have that village, you know, this village everyone talks about, you know, does it even exist, um, to raise a child, which makes it very difficult for them to have that time to be able to, you know, be the individual they were before having mm-hmm. kids, for example. And that's tough. And then you have to think about how... You know, what else is contributing to that in terms of, for example, the socioeconomic crisis, in terms of, you know, funding cuts, in terms of people being able to afford things and not being able to afford things that you talked about, being able to afford a nanny. Not everyone can afford that. And we have to think about this as a society in terms of how do we level things out so that people can have respite. So I talked about having a you know working in a respite service from the age of 15 up until about, I think, 20. And... Um, that allowed those parents to have that time and that was funded by the government. I'm not sure if so much of that is happening at the moment. And I think we need to have more respite service. Mm. We need to have that opportunity for parents to be able to have that time to themselves Mm. so that they can, it's a ripple effect. You support parents, you're supporting children, you're raising a better future generation. I mean, Rachel Carroll, who is the founder of Cora Kids, I mean, she talked about childcare being basic infrastructure yeah um which will support not only mothers but also parents and society in general yeah and so i think definitely governments can do a lot more to create more affordable childcare because i think in this country in particular it's a massive massive problem yes and what you're talking about is going even a stage further yes. about how do you provide support for the parents yeah. and to be able to give them that respite, that break, yeah. that mental break, which will make them better parents, yeah. better employees. Yes. Let's face it. Like yeah. if you're or employers, home, yeah. you're going to be much better performer in the workplace. Absolutely. And all of that, I think like leaving your emotions at home, so to speak, is really not serving us in becoming more effective leaders, better employees. What's your advice on how to raise kids to be effective leaders? Okay, so when we talk about what makes a great leader, let's think about all the different elements. So for example, communication skills. I think that's important, first of all. I think we need to be promoting that at home, promoting that in schools, helping children to learn effective communication skills and you know, interpersonal skills. That's something that I think parents need to focus on. So allow your children to question you. You know, don't raise children that just say yes to everything. Don't raise people pleasers. I think the generation before us really focused on that. You know, I had to do a lot of work to overcome being a people pleaser. And I'm still doing work on that, actually, because I felt like I had to say yes to please my parents, to everything, and, you know, to to make sure that they were happy. And 
that was at detriment to myself at times because actually I didn't want to do certain things. And as I was growing up, when I realised I've got a will, I don't have to say yes, um, you know, that creates some tensions. But I think we should promote in a household that actually at a dinner table, your children can question you. Your children can um, say no and have a different opinion. And we should welcome that. We should encourage that. So that's really important to be to begin with. And also as basic as organisation skills. I mean, some children, depending on whether they have a need or not, would find that much more harder than others. But there are ways, there are strategies that you could use. So for example, in my household, we have a visual checklist of a routine to get out the house in the morning. Otherwise it doesn't work. And I get my daughter, although she's free, to tick it that she's put on her uniform, she's put on her shoes, bag, and so forth. So organisation skills, you can start teaching that from a very young age through using visuals, through using nursery rhymes, making songs and so forth. I think that's really important. And, you know, I also think that we should talk about motivation as well. And lots of young people, I mean, I worked with um, 16 and upwards whilst teaching. They all really started to think about the idea of a nine to five is not good, so I'm gonna go and do something like YouTube, TikTok. They're all great jobs, by the way. I've got nothing against that. But I think, you know, we should also promote the idea of helping young people and children to be motivated to aspire to anything that they want to be and not just one area, for example. So I believe we're all born with multiple skills. So there's multiple avenues you can go down when it comes to your career. Uh, but some are more motivated than others. And I think if we emphasize on helping our children to become more motivated, that would help as well. But also recognizing if they have a need, if they're having a genuine difficulty, an underlying difficulty that is um, having a ripple effect, a negative ripple effect from them to be motivated, that needs to be addressed first mm. and supported so that we can, for example, your mental health can have a negative impact on your motivation. Motivation to go to school, motivation to learn, and you know, genuine issues. There's a huge rise of um, emotional-based school avoiders at the moment. And Say that again? Emotional-based school avoiders. And what is that? So those, um, it's, it's a new term. I don't really like using it as such because I think school avoidance is not just based on emotions. There are so many other contributing factors that could um, stop a child from going to school. Not that they won't go to school, it's that they can't go to school. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the past people use terms like school refusers. No, they're not school refusers they can't go to school because they have a mental health need or a physical and sensory need or social communication need that is acting as a barrier, stopping them from going to school. So we need to think about how do we support those children? Mm -hmm. And, you know, thinking about effective leaders, we have to go back to the basics. You really do. Um, what else is, a, you know, what makes an effective leader? Let's talk about um, social skills in terms of social interaction, social communication, how to interpret social cues. So for example, knowing when to stop talking. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh, you know, knowing when someone's facial expression has changed because you've said something that has maybe triggered them and finding a way to repair that, that isn't really emphasised on at school or at home, unless you've got an identified need and uh, if you're receiving support from a professional, then they might suggest a social skills group. But I think that should be a universal offer. It shouldn't just be for children with needs. I think all children should be specifically put into a program where they learn social skills and conflict resolution skills. You know, we might have a reduction in crime rates, for example, because of that, mm -hmm. you know, rather than oh, there's conflict, let's take it to the extreme level. You know, how do we resolve this conflict amicably and walk away peacefully? You know, that needs to be emphasised. That's what makes a great leader. How do you propose to do that? How do we do that? Mm. Right, so there's lots of evidence-based tools such as social stories, for example, where you create an alternative scenario to help a, a child to see. So it's like role-playing? It's like role-playing, yes. Right. Well, through using visuals. Sometimes you can even make a comic strip conversation to help a child to see the other person's perspective and the impact of their actions on others. Now, some children cannot do that if they lack what we call theory of the mind. So being able to understand that their views, their beliefs, their needs are unique to others. And they may need support to develop that, for example, through what we call a mediated learning experience. This is all psychology. 
And, you know, which is why it's, it's important that a psychologist is talking about these things. So there are lots of people talking about these things who don't have the background research and knowledge, which I find quite scary. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it's important that, yes, we're talking about what makes a leader, but we also need to address children's needs, what's stopping them from learning these skills to potentially become an effective leader in the future. And we need to address those. So say you're a, you're a parent, you're concerned for your child, there's mm. something not quite right. Like, what do you need to look out for? Um, you need to have a conversation, first of all, with the school to find out whether the problem or the concern is only noticed at home or also noticed at school because there are children masking at the moment. So there are lots of children who may people please at school and at home is where they are able to be their authentic self. And sometimes it's vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that needs to, that conversation needs to happen. And you might want to seek professional support if if the concern is having an impact on your ability or the child, well, the child's ability essentially to function adequately. If it's having an impact, so for example, if you notice that your child has attention and concentration skills and it's having an impact on the child's ability to sustain conversations or to stay on the topic of conversations or to learn or to engage in tasks as such as daily living tasks, like having a shower, brushing their teeth. And that's a time to raise the concern with your school. I would first of all say that's your first point of contact. Mm -hmm. Some people go to their GP. And if the school monitor your child's needs and the concerns persist, they might then get a professional like myself, an educational psychologist, or uh, other appropriate professionals like speech and language therapists, occupational therapists, depending on what your child's needs are. How do people end up working with you? Because is it being referred to you? Do parents come directly to you? How do people find you? So, um, word of mouth actually. Um, so, like I said, a lot of parents are heightened at the moment based on the media, what they're seeing, and um, they notice a slight difference in their child and they might think, right, that's it my child has this label, that label. So um, they seek support from parents groups. I've had people come to me to say, we found you in a Facebook group in Stevenage. I don't know, what's <laughs> the Facebook group in Stevenage? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, um, and um, you know, working within the local authority as well, you build relationships with schools, you build relationships with um, the community uh, through social media, for example, people find me. Um, what I'm really doing is promoting the role of educational psychology. I think we've done lots of things in terms of research, academic work, but we haven't really done much promotion within the public, especially for the younger generation. I think that's something that I'm really emphasising on. So people understand the role we have to play mm -hmm. and how important it is and how well placed we are to actually support families, support schools and create that partnership between home and school. What's the best piece of parenting advice you've received? It was my supervisor saying to me, relax, actually, and stop being so anxious. That was a game changer for me because then it meant whatever I read, whatever information or workshop or whatever I attended, I was able to receive that information and implement it and apply it to real life. Mm -hmm. But if you're anxious, if your emotions are heightened, you can't hear, you can't problem solve, you can't think, actually. There's a cognitive dissonance happening. So it's important that you take care of yourself and you relax. Mm -hmm. And then you are in a better place to be able to support your children. So I always say a happy mother, a happy father, happy child. And happy educational psychologists, happy children, young people <laughs> that I, you know, I serve. Mm. So I would say focus on that. And also it's important to unlearn a lot of things that you may have learned. So for example, in some cultures, slacking is still a method. And I don't think that's effective. Research has shown that it's not effective. Um, in some cultures, you know, learning, they've learned things even from TV programs like Naughty Step and Time Out and... Uh, does Naughty Step not work? No, it's terrible. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> what should people do instead? Okay, so learn about emotional coaching. That's an evidence-based approach to help you to actually co-regulate with your child. So you're teaching them and not leaving them feeling abandoned. Because, I mean, think about it. You send a young child to their room or to the naughty step or sit on the thinking chair or, you know, stand in that corner, face the wall, and you've left them to problem-solve everything on their own. And actually, their brain hasn't got the skill, the capacity to do that. So... 
it's important to co-regulate with them. And emotional coaching, if I simplify it into three steps, I mean, there are multiple steps, but actually involves, first of all, acknowledging, labeling, naming the feelings. So for example, if your child is upset, you can actually say, oh dear, I can see that you're upset. And saying it's okay to cry. It's okay to cry. I get it. That's powerful. You are validating their feelings. And then once you have made sort of progression from that and you see that you've actually gotten your child's attention, then you can set a limit to say, okay, would you like to spend some time by yourself or do you want mommy to, or daddy to sit here with you? And some children might say, yes, I want you to sit here with me and you can just sit there and just, you know, rest with the feelings. We need to start teaching children and young people and adults actually to rest with your feelings. Just because you have a feeling doesn't mean it has to go away this instant, just because you're uncomfortable with it. It's okay to let it rest, let it stay there and let it pass on its own because it has a purpose. Mm -hmm. Your feeling is, your feelings is your nervous system telling you that there's something that you need to address. So we need to start teaching children to do that as well, to rest with their feelings and you know, set a time and you can check in on them if they want to be alone and say, are you okay now? Would you like to talk about what's happened? And if they are, then only then can you problem solve. But trying to problem solve when they're screaming and they're crying and they're distressed, it's a no-no. Because remember what I said earlier, when emotions are heightened, you can't think, you can't problem solve. They can't hear you. They can't receive I think it. what often happens is that the parents themselves can't think straight either. So they just re revert back to the methods that their yeah. parents used on them. Mm. And so then it becomes this vicious circle because yeah. you're both Easily stuck done. in it. Yes. And what you said about co-regulation mm. and like, I know this method and it's something that came very, very, it was so uncomfortable to mm. use that. But with my daughter who, who is very emotionally colorful <laughs> and she has her outburst once in a while and I remember just coming like we know what are you feeling mm. and where are you feeling it and a lot of it is to do with just like feeling extreme like anger mm. kind of rising up which also makes me very angry yeah and this idea of co-regulation something I didn't I didn't anticipate would happen because when you step into that your own you start to yourself co-regulate, yeah. which also leads the child to regulate. And yes. it then becomes the more virtual circle. Yes. So you kind of both calm down together. So this is something that I didn't anticipate that would happen. That would be a really useful life skill. And I think for anyone who is a primary caregiver, especially mm. has an edge when it comes to leadership. And I yeah. know there are some studies talking about how you know female brain the prefrontal cortex yes. is well much more connected mm -hmm. which also means that they have more rational thinking yeah rather than emotional thinking as yeah. to what we traditionally think of yeah. as women yes and we, that's why women can be much better effective leaders yeah. because that needs to kind of kick in and then plus having that experience mm -hmm. of having to deal with somebody who is just so unreasonable yes. like where do you go with that yeah um, so I just find this whole field of psychology, emotional regulation, emotional intelligence, yes. like how you deal with kids, so fascinating. And I know there's a lot we didn't go into yes. because you work with very difficult cases, yes. very difficult situations mm. and having to understand the kids, but also work with the parents. Yes. So I would encourage any parent mm. that wants to have a better understanding of their own children, of themselves, to follow you on yeah. Instagram. I think yes. that's the platform that yes, you use yes. the most. Yes, yes, attend a workshop, um, or I could actually do individual assessments. I do therapeutic work as well, following from that as well. That's absolutely what I do, and I think it's very important. Essentially, I would love to be in everybody's pockets one day, you know, mm. where you can pull out an app and get advice on any topic related to children and young people and you will find something there that could be useful for them i think that's really important and also gain knowledge on child development is very important learn what is age appropriate what is not age appropriate and sometimes what you think isn't age appropriate is for example so you know that sort of you know reduces the anxiety that parents feel I think that's very important. And just be conscious, be intentional about your parenting. So even when you talked about co-regulation, if you can't do it in that time, it's okay to take yourself to another room. 
to regulate personally first and then come back to support your child. Mm. That's why I emphasize a lot on the relaxation and the looking after you because that's really important, especially if you don't have that support system to help you to, uh, you know, someone that you can go to to seek support. It's important to focus on that. If it means just going to another room, having a cup of tea while it's hot, do yeah. that. <laughs> while it's hot, yeah. it's dream. <laughs> a cup of tea, yes. Indeed. You know, mm. do that and then come back in, into the room mm. to then co-regulate with your child. Because children pick up on these things. And, you know, your yes needs to be your yes, your no needs to be your no. You need to be very clear. You need to be very calm to be able to use any strategies such as emotional regulation, whether it's social stories, uh, comic strips, conversations, whatever it is. You need to be calm. And if you're not, you need to find a way to get to that stage, whether it's you want to engage in mindfulness, for example. There are lots of apps out there to help you with mindfulness, uh, meditation, for example, breathing techniques, grounding techniques. And if you can make it a cultural way of being for your household, even better. So, for example, we all use breathing strategies in my household. I mean, it's funny because I, I see my daughter doing it to her peers to so, say, you know, she goes, it's okay to cry. No. It's okay to be upset. And, mm. and it just says, take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing to be able to give your child that kind of a toolbox yeah. to be able to deal with yeah. for the rest of their lives. Like how amazing. they can do that for themselves, but plus they can do that for other people. Exactly. What a superpower. Yes, yes. Yeah. And if the, you know, the rest of the world could be like that, that would be amazing. And I know it's going to be much more difficult for others. It, depending on their need and their circumstances. Mm -hmm. But I think if we start to take a step, you know, someone said to me, oh, you, you're, you're doing these workshops, but if your child has Down syndrome, they're not going to be able to, um, you know, meet age-related expectations, potentially, depending on, you know, their need and other circumstances. And I said, well, to me, it's not about getting your child to meet a milestone or to reach age-related expectations or to get the best grades. It's about helping them to maximise their potential and to maximise their abilities, their strengths. That's what matters. Mm -hmm. So I often work in a solution-focused way by focusing on the strengths. What is going well? I do an appreciative inquiry. What are you doing well and how can we do more of it? I'm a huge believer on focusing on things that are going well. Yes. And focusing on your strengths mm. as opposed to trying to fix your weaknesses. Yes. Because if you are weak at something, sure, you know, there's certain things that you can, you know, just get up to speed a little bit more. Mm. But when it comes to focusing on your strengths, that's where your real advantage lies. Yeah. If you're naturally weak at something, you will just never naturally be as good at it as somebody else so just focus on that strength and same thing for your kids mm. and i think something that i personally believe is important is being able to spot what the strengths of your kids are mm. and work with those things yes as opposed to just trying to bring them up to a you know as you're talking about like yeah. achieving milestones yeah. or you know having the best grades exactly yeah. like focus on what they do well yes. and what they're naturally inclined for. Yes. And that will become something that will be basically their superpowers yeah. when they grow up. Put it this way, self-regulation to me is the predictor for success. So if we can have a society that is much better equipped to be self-regulated, then we would have a much more successful society. On that note, <laughs> I want to leave that. That is that is it. This is one hundred percent true. And Patricia, thank you so much for coming thank on you. the show. Fascinating talking to you. Absolutely, and your work is so important. And you know, keep spreading your light. And thank you. You know, being amazing with you know having to deal with very very challenging situations, and for just teaching the world about how to support kids how to support themselves and um, yeah thank you so much for being on the show thank you it's been a pleasure you've been listening to anatomy of a leader podcast i'm your host maria vorostovsky if you haven't already please follow and subscribe this podcast and i'll see you in the next episode <laughs>